experience. A complex word, pulling in different directions simultaneously. At once transient, fleeting, accidental and trivial, the stuff of the banal everyday world, yet simultaneously formative, essential to our sense of self, identity and beliefs. Philosophers like Kant have been drawn towards it as the necessary content of life and repelled by its apparent lack of grounding for universal conditions of knowledge or moral judgment. Kant did recognise that experience is a production, in part a production that the individual subject is engaged in as they synthesise time and space to make phenomena intelligible, but more fundamentally for Kant it is a production by the universal conceptual principles of the mind. Building on Kant and Hegel, Marx gave a different basis for the production of experience. Declaring that the senses were historical, something that Kant could not contemplate, he wrote, The forming of the five senses is a labour of the entire history of the world down to the present. The eye and the ear are historically cultivated, as much as they are also natural organs constituting the kind of beings that we are. And today, the eye and the ear are technologically augmented and mediated. As the senses produce an object world of utility or beauty, or as they consume that object world of utility or beauty, so the senses of the subject and the sensuous nature of the object world are historically developed. But if experience is a historical production, the difficulties in its conceptualizations are also historically produced. For example, a natural science model of experience, as behaviours to be controlled and predicted, has extended deep into social life, with devastating consequences for our ability to think and act as if experience could be changed, that it really belongs to us. To escape the consequences of his own deterministic philosophy, Kant appealed to the concept of techni, a word associated with crafted labour that presupposes a relationship to the world where skills and autonomy are to the fore. When that creative relationship to the world is broken, we are no longer in charge of our own experiences, or even how we think about them. Experience congeals into a taken-for-granted acceptance that the phenomena that strikes the ear, the eye, the taste buds, has fully disclosed its inner secrets, its origins and its processes. Illusory fantasies of control try to compensate for what has been lost. Marx called this commodity fetishism, a term denoting the contracted reach of experience into the underlying relationships. On the one hand, experience marks an absence, an exclusion of what has been repressed. On the other hand, if we can put our finger on what is missing, the gap between experience and language can be a powerful politics igniting utopian desires for change. This is the ambivalence of experience. In terms of time, experience indicates the evolution of the person and consciousness, a cumulative and interdependent growing associated with learning and communication. As when we say a person is experienced in something, experience indicates pattern similarities that coalesce into group and collective expressions and are the basis of what we call cultures. Hence the politics of recognition, identification and representation of whose experience and with what levels of esteem predominate in the public sphere. But experience may also be a dull iteration of failed models and practices an inability to really learn from what is not working, to confuse age with wisdom. In key words, Raymond Williams notes a dual temporal sense of experience, as time past and accumulated, and as time present. 
The experience may be an intense sense of the present. When we feel something is an experience, we are suggesting that it is some kind of rupture from the norm, from the quotidian. This may not necessarily be a pleasant experience, for example in the case of trauma. The aesthetic has long been seen as at least some kind of heightened mode of experience. certain middle-class version of the aesthetic, as heightened mode of experience, has not inquired sufficiently into the nature of the everyday world that the aesthetic is offering some intense new vantage point on, and it has privatised the nature of the aesthetic experience rather than insisting on its essential social and socialising nature. Three hundred years of bourgeois readings of Kant have encrusted themselves on his thought and made him the philosophical source of an individualistic, antisocial version of the aesthetic. In Critique of Judgment, Kant tried to find in the appreciation of beauty a type of experience that could reconcile lawful rules with freedom. The aesthetic was a singular experience and therefore preserved individual agency. You cannot say you've enjoyed a book because someone else has told you about it. We want to submit the book to our own eyes, just as if our liking of it depended on that sensation. But the aesthetic experience is only truly meaningful and pleasurable because it can be communicated to others or is indeed a communication to you from those others who made it. It was this intersubjectivity that allowed Kant to imagine a more malleable lawful experience than he could when philosophising the conditions of pure reason. The aesthetic experience allowed a form of play, a play with ideas with social roots, through sense perception. The tiniest unit in the play of forms, such as a cut in a film or a cross dissolve, as here in the big sleep, is pregnant with meaning. Blink and you'll miss it. Why the cross dissolve between Sam Spade ringing the bell and the butler answering the door? because the cross dissolve signifies a small passage of time and thus the largeness of the interior space that must be traversed in order to answer the door. Space per square foot of real estate conveys the wealth of the owner inside that space. The humble cross dissolve in this context communicates time, size and wealth. But in another context, perhaps something else entirely, hence the plasticity of meaning in the hands of the cultural producer. Aesthetic ideas can be, when the aesthetic is working at its best, heterodox. Its lawfulness not a projection of harmony, but a warning in a moment of danger. Raymond Williams tried to get at this with his idea of a structure of feeling. The term is an attempt to bring together the sense of structures which have definite social bases and something more intangible, felt, experienced, but not necessarily formally acknowledged or set down, perhaps something, William said, at the very edge of semantic availability. At the very edge, that is, of what the social order can really cope with. Already in the 1920s, Siegfried Krakauer tried to shift cultural analysis away from high art. 
mass cultural commodities was socially significant, the most inconspicuous surface level expressions of a society provide, he said, access to the fundamental substance of the state of things. The dialectical image can reveal an entire social or historical landscape. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country, and night fell on a different world, a world where freedom itself is under attack, is under attack. Freedom itself is under attack. Here, in Ken Loach's documentary short on the other 9-11, a whole panorama of propaganda and imperialist violence is lit up in one cut from George W. Bush in 2001 to footage of the US-sponsored coup against Salvador Allende, the elected Marxist president of Chile on September the 11th, 1973. What happens to experience when the billionaire class make history while the rest of humanity are cast in the role of spectators. History is what hurts, and when it hurts enough, people may seize the means of production, even if the means of production are only camcorders, as here in Trouble the Waters. It could be dead people right now as we speak in these houses, because the, the National Guard, they have not been here. All right, it ain't recorded, my brother. Got 30 more minutes. The aesthetic is not a contemplative refuge from the world, but a rendezvous with history. <laughs> <laughs>